As usual, Shakur Stevenson comes out picking and poking over the undefeated Japanese contender Yoshino, who previously had a knockout victory over Masayoshi Nakatani. Um, Shakur Steven comes out um, more aggressively than he usually does, and he's able to control distance well. Yoshino can't, Yoshino can't get close to him. You know, Shakur Stevenson, you know, putting his punches together quite nicely. In the second round, he drops Yoshino with a left hand. Yoshino gets up. You know, Shakur Stevenson continues to hit him with all kinds of shots, all kinds of hooks, and whatever. Yoshino's just kind of, you know, in a hunched in stance, you know, leaning forward, which I guess made him more on board to shots and whatnot. Uh, times where Shakur Stevenson literally came right at Yoshino and tried to do some inside work on him, which is pretty good, by the way, and Yoshino still can't really touch him. Um, Shakur Stevenson floored, uh, I think, Yoshino again in the fourth round. Uh, let me just check here because I scored a fight. Floored him again in the, in the fourth round, I think with a right hook this time. Yoshino gets up, and you can see at this point, you know, Shakur Stevenson's dominating the fight and whatnot. But Yoshino is still in the fight, you know, he's not out or anything like that. He's still got his wits about him. And then in the sixth round, Shakur Stevenson hits him a couple of punches, and the referee calls it off. Now, first glance watching the fight, I was like, maybe that's not too bad of a stoppage because Shakur Stevenson was dominating. Second time watching it, Shakur Stevenson was still dominating, but Yoshino was still in the fight. You know, there was no indication that he couldn't continue or anything like that. He was still, you know, had his wits about him or anything like that. And I don't think he got hurt really throughout the fight. He just, you know, got dropped a couple of times and dominated. So I feel like the fight should have continued from there on in. But yeah, Shakur Stevenson looks the way he usually does, except that he's more aggressive this time. And he was able to get the, I guess, the quote-unquote stoppage here, you know. But Shakur Stevenson is showing his power, you know, he's able to drop guys and whatnot. And see what's next for him really and truly you know there's not really much to say about this fight because Shakur Stevenson looks how he usually does um controls distance well great footwork you know puts his punches together you know nicely you know good guarding and everything the guy know what he's doing you know so we'll see what happens with him next <clears throat> so Jared Anderson takes an undefeated contender George Arias um, well, when I really call him a contender, I know it's not really recognised as one, but <clears throat> Jared Anderson takes him on and about on the feeds and it's established right there and right there at that moment in time. Um, Jared Anderson being a much bigger guy, the taller guy, Jared Anderson establishing his jab well, you know, showing good power, good got bleh, I can't talk, showing good good shot selection, he's cut off the you know, the ring quite nicely. Hitting Iris with some good body shots. I don't really remember a time where Iris really caught him with anything, truth be told. But it was like this for the first two rounds. And then in the third round, he started to really put it together, hitting him, uh, Iris in the body, hitting him to the head. And towards the ending of the third round, he hit Iris with, you know, a combination and it really hurt Iris badly. He was, you know, he was hurt bad. Uh, his nose was bloody and everything. And the moment he came back to his corner after the third round, you know, they, they waved it off and said, no, nah, the fight's over. So Jared Anderson just wins the fight just like that. You know, Jared Anderson looks pretty good. Like I said, he's got a good jab, powerful jab. Um, he puts his punches together, a nice combination puncher and everything. Um, good power. You know, he looks good. He looks good. Um, I did hear about George Arias. I've heard about George Arias for years. Um, and, you know, watching Hatman's videos. Hatman, you speak about George Arias. And this was like back in 2018. And then... George Irish just disappeared from the face to earth. Like, no one knew anything about him. Like, I didn't even know he was so fine or anything like that. You know, he just disappeared from the face of the earth. I think inactivity and whatever. And then all of a sudden, his name just pops up again when he fights Jared Anderson. It's crazy. You know, but, you know, Jared Anderson ended up stopping him quite quickly. And there you go. Um, so, yeah, he retains 100% knockout percentage. Um, people saying Jared Anderson can fight these guys or that guy. But some of them are unrealistic at this point in time. I think I might want to see some, uh, Jared Anderson fight someone like Carlos Takam, you know, someone that can take him rounds. You know, Carlos Takam recently upset Tony Oka and took um, Arsenal Bet Matt Madoff the distance, breaking his 100% knockout um, percentage. You know, Carlos Takam's a tough customer. You know, he's, you know, giving Povetkin a tough fight. You know, he did lose every round against AJ, but, you know, it wasn't, you know, easy. Like, the scorecards make it, you know, um, look easier than what it actually was. You know, you... you Proof be tricky for AJ, he gave um, Joseph Parker a tough fight. And, jo you know, Carlos Sackham is tough himself. You know, he was landing several big shots on Joe Joyce. I think Carlos Sackham will be a good test for someone like Jared Anderson and could, you know, give him some rounds and whatnot. Um, 
at this point, I think Jared Anderson just needs someone that can take him rounds. I know Joe Forrest was supposed to be that guy, but Jared Anderson took him out, you know, pretty quickly. And Jared Anderson did, did show some vulnerabilities in that fight with his defence when Joe, Jerry Forrest clipped him. Not many people saw this, but Jerry Forrest clipped him and Jared and Anderson's legs did wobble a little bit. So it, can, it is shown that he can be hurt, you know, um, but he still got Jerry Forrest quickly. So maybe Carlos Stack is that guy that can take him rounds. Some people may say Kevin Johnson, but... And maybe Jeremy, Kevin Johnson couldn't take him rest because Kevin Johnson t- to this day is still taking people the distance at his old ass age, you know. But it's also highly, you know, possible at this point in Kevin Johnson's career that Jared Anderson takes him out too, you know. But I wonder if there's really that many people these days that can take Jared Anderson rounds. Some people may say Derek Jazora, you know, but is that realistic at this point, you know, in time? You know, Jazora's going to ask a lot of money to fight someone like Jared Anderson. So, but I think Carlos Takam should be the next step for, um, you know, Jared Anderson at this point, to be honest with you. Okay, Sean Davis gets a ninth round stoppage over Anthony Yigit. Um, okay, Sean Davis, you know, for a prospect, looks pretty good. You know, prospect, he won a uh, silver medal at the 2020 Olympic Games in Tokyo in 2021. Um, you know, he judges distance well. Um, he tried to use his jab, you know, earlier on, but he couldn't really use it effectively like that because of... um. And so you get southpaw stance, but he did hit him with some good right hands to the head and, you know, hit him with some good hooks, hit him with some very good body shots as well. Um, and, you know, really exposed and he gets, you know, like a head movement. And it was just like that for most of the fight where, you know, Keishawn Davis, you know, he showed good defense whenever you get tried to hit him with telegraph punches and punches that didn't really have much power behind it. Um, and Keishawn Davis just picking him off with some good combinations, which has some power behind it too. Um, he's got very good shot selection. He was very good at cutting off the ring as well. And that's pretty much what it was the entire fight. He dropped him in the eighth round. And then um, he dropped him. Wait, was it the eighth round? Yeah, he dropped him in the eighth round. And then he was beating him up, beating him up along the ropes. And then stopped him in the ninth. Um, Keishon Davis called out uh, Frank Martin after the fight. I'm not too sure about that one. As of now, I'm not too sure. You know, maybe he might need a couple of fights for that one. I'm not too sure. Um, but I've been watching Keishon Davis here and there. You know, I'm not going to sit there and say I've been watching every fight of his. I haven't. But I thought I'd take a look at this. And he looked pretty good. You know, he seems to be very methodical in there. He doesn't really try and rush anything, especially given at his age and whatnot. He doesn't rush anything. He's very methodical, puts his punches together. And it kind of shows that, you know, because he's um trained by Bomac and he spars with Crawford, he spars with Shakur and everything like that. So he kind of, you know, takes off to them where they don't really rush anything. And, you know, they just take their time. All of them have good shot selection, you know. Excuse me. And they seem very skillful. So I'll be intrigued to see what's, you know, coming up with um, Keishawn Davis next. Filipino underdog Marlon Tapeles shocks um, the Uzbekistan unified champion undefeated fire uh, MJ Amadalaev. Um, Amadalaev got off to a really slow start. Tapeles fought a very strategic fight, you know, kind of keeping, you know, Amadalaev arranged, but at the same time, you know, jabbing him to the body and him and some power left, um, overhand lefts. And Amadalaev just couldn't really get near him. You know, anytime Amadalaev tried to throw the left hand, you know, Tapeles would get underneath it and encounter with his own left hand. And it was like that for, you know, several rounds, like the first six rounds and such. You know, Amadalaev did have his moments here and there, but I felt like Tapeles won, you know, a lot of those rounds, you know, quite clearly, despite the fact that there wasn't really much punches thrown in the six rounds between the two. Um, and later on, you know, Amadalaev started to pick it up. I think, he, I think I gave him around like the seventh round and then Tapeles took back the eighth round and then, Matt Madalaya all the way from nine rounds to twelve, he started to pick it up as Tapales started to gas, you know, you know, Matt Madalaya started to find more success with the left hand, you know, started hitting did he start hitting Tapales with his own body shots and whatnot? I can't even remember. But he started hitting with his own jab, he started to back up Tapales a lot more, and Tapales wasn't throwing as much as he once was either. But it was too little too late. I had Tapales won in the fight seven five and Tapales was awarded a fight on a split decision. Uh 115-113, 115-113, 118-110 uh, in his favour, which is surprising because I don't think Tapeles is a matchroom fighter and he won a close decision on a matchroom show. 
I thought, well, just by looking at it, I thought, you know, he won this fight clearly, but they done it a split decision because it's a matching fight. But no, it was a f close fight, a close but clear fight. But it was a close fight, and they actually gave it to Tablets, which is crazy. Now, this fight wasn't exactly a war, but it wasn't a ball either. Like, both guys were very strategic. Both guys were technical. Apparently, both guys have a reputation for their punching power. I'm not too sure. I don't know two guys, um, either of these guys like that. Uh, I know Atma Delay have more. I've watched three of his fights, including this one. Well, this will be the third fight. I watched his fight against Danny Roma, which was three years ago. I haven't seen it since. I saw his fight against Ronnie Rios, but I wasn't even really paying attention. <laughs> I watched that. And then this fight here. And I've never seen the um, Tapler's fight, you know. But both guys apparently seem to have a reputation for you to punch us. So I guess they seemed, you know, where everyone eat of, of each other's power. And there was like very, being very technical in there, you know. But they was hitting each other big shots occasionally and whatnot, you know. So it wasn't at the ball. It wasn't a war, but it wasn't a ball. You know, it was a, it was a, it was a pretty decent fight to watch, you know. But that's really what I've got to say. Two circles as well, if I didn't mention that already. And yeah, this is a pretty good fight to watch. But Tablez, you know, upset the odds. He's now the unified bantamweight champion. So he's he's going to be looking to fight the winner of um, Inouye and Fulton. If Inouye was to win the Fulton fight, it would be an all-Asian clash for Undisputed, Japanese versus Filipino, and they've kind of had a rivalry for quite some time, uh, the Japanese and the Filipinos, you know, and a lot of Filipinos are probably going to start flocking over to, you know, Tapeles, you know, um, like they did with Casemiro after, he, you know, he beat, uh, what's the guy's name, Jelani Tete, you know, and, you know, Casemiro fans rallying after him, oh, or rallying with him and whatnot, and, in a way, he was going to just fire him, and then that fight fell through because, you know, COVID and whatnot, and he never really got rescheduled, you know. And then now Casemiro don't even have a title anymore, and now he's fighting at Super Bantamweight as well. So, but yeah, that's what I really got to say. Good fight. Very good fight. Bam Rodriguez picked up his second world title in the second weight division um, against, what's the guy's name? Christian Gonzalez Hernandez. Hernandez wins the first round. He's moving around, throwing some punches. Uh, Bam Rodriguez hasn't got started yet. And then for the rest of the fight, Bam Rodriguez wins the rest of his rounds. Able to hit um, Hernandez with some body shots, hitting him with some good head shots and whatnot. Blah, 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 blah. Sixth round, Bam got his jaw broken. Yeah. Um, he got caught with his mouth open. And then it's supposed to click some shot and he got his jaw broken and whatnot, and whatever. But Bam was able to win the fight quite convincingly. Some people say it didn't look good, but... I don't think there's much more he could have done to me, honestly, against an opponent that was moving away from him, you know, constantly. He wasn't able to move at an angle because, you know, his opponent was moving on him consistently, you know. Um, I think he did as good as he could have done, to be honest with you, you know. I think people f expected far too much of him because of his um, Saul Rumble side performance, but I said it even, you know, I think even when I recorded the video, that not every performance is going to be like that. Saul Rumble side is an aging slow footed easy to hit fire always has been easy to hit always has been slow footed and someone like Bam Rodriguez is always going to piece him up like that you know not every fire is slow footed aging and is you know defensively incompetent as Saul Rambasai is you know so not every performance is going to be like that and people start to get carried away by saying oh Bam Rodriguez is going to defeat Chocolatillo Estrada and all the other super flyaways with his hand um, tied behind his back you know people get carried away as they usually do you know, and now he goes a distance a couple of times, you know, and doesn't look anywhere close to what he did against Soromasa. And now all of a sudden people are saying, well, he's not looking good anymore. No, Bam is still looking good. It's just that he's not fighting the same, he's not fighting Soromasa this time. That's why. Um, I think so, I think Amoeba is someone that's going to give him trouble, a world-class Amoeba. Those guys are the ones that are going to give him trouble, you know, because of how hard it is for Bam Rodriguez to set angles and whatnot. He's not able to, you know, post combinations to get as much years as he's finding a slow for the guy, as to be expected, you know. But to be honest with you, I don't think he really looked that bad, you know. But now he's got a jaw broken and he's had surgery, always going to have surgery. Um, he's going to need a long time to recover and whatnot, blah, 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 blah. So he, this could be his last fight of the year already, you know, you never know. But they're talking about a fight between him and Sonny Edwards and the unification and whatnot. People want to see that. Um... Wait, what's uh flyaway? So is Julio Cesar Martinez at the way? 
Um, I think he might be. I think he is he Lucy's mother. I think he's at the way as well. Maybe they could go for that. I don't know. But fights to be made out there for Bam Rodriguez. Um, I know he's trying to win. I know he wanted to win, become a two weight world champion. But it is kind of disappointing that he was done all that work at Super Flyweight to then vacate that title and move down. Like that. That's very backwards to me. To be honest with you, I can't even lie. You know, but especially it's even worse, especially when people were hyping him up the way they did. And then he just moves back down. Like it's kind of embarrassing for those that were talking like that. But you know, <laughs> but he looked good. He looked good. That's all I gotta say. You know, so he's gotta take a long time to recover, and we'll see how that affects him. You know, going on. Well, that was quite inevitable, wasn't it? <laughs> it was gonna happen sooner or later. You know, <laughs> um, yeah, that's exactly what happened. Fondoro gets knocked the fuck out by Brian Mendoza. Brian Mendoza, um, in his previous fight, knocked out Jason Rosario, who's known for having a weakness to body shots. Like, seriously, that guy cannot take a, take it to the body. Like, his body is made out of fucking paper, you know. And he sent Rosario into retirement. Yeah, Rosario is retired, apparently. Um, <clears throat> but the fight starts off. It's actually, Fondoro's actually head up in this fight. Um, Fondora was actually using his range as he should have been. He was doing the same thing in the Carlos Sacambo fight in the early rounds. He was using his range and he was picking off Brian Mendoza from a distance, and Brian Mendoza couldn't really, you know, get to him like that. And then after a couple of rounds, Fondora thought it was a great idea to start trading with Brian Mendoza. He started pushing him back. He started landing some pretty good shots on him. I think he bloodied his nose a bit or something like that. And he was still winning the rounds and whatnot in there. You know, but he was getting clipped more. No fucking surprise. And in the seventh round, at close range, Ryan Mendoza was able to clip him with a left hook, which basically had the uh, David Price Povetkin effect. And, you know, he's basically just asleep standing up. And then Brian Mendoza clipped him with a right hand, which sent Fondora crashing onto the canvas. And, you know, Fondora looks like he could get up, but he kind of motions his glove, like, you know, shakes it and he's like, no. And he starts smiling and he doesn't really make an attempt to get up. It looks like he can get up, but he doesn't. He just sits there, he smiles. And he's like he's saying no to the ref like he doesn't want to continue. I don't know if it's just me that's seen that. But that's what it kind of is. And he just allowed himself to be counted out. And that was that. Brian Mendoza, you know, goes to the shock. And he's now the WBC interim champion. So now that means he's mandatory. The WBC mandatory for Jamel Charlo. You know, there you go. It, it was going to happen soon, sooner, sooner than later, you know. Or sooner or later, I should say. Like, Fandora just gives up his height and reach when he does not need to. If he, if he literally fought, if he literally stood at range, like he did against the Campo the first couple of rounds, and like he did here against the first couple of rounds, he would not be getting hit as much as he does. He would be having far more success. But for some reason, something in him just feel the need to give up his height and reach completely, donate his chin on a silver platter into his opponents, and just have a full, a full out war. You know what I mean? Like, he's completely exposed. He can't duck underneath shots. You know, he can't exactly slip shots because of how fucking tall he is. You know, so why are you going toe-to-toe -to -toe with shorter fighters that can do that shit? I don't understand. I don't get it. You know, he should have used his higher reach, but that's just not the kind of person he is. And eventually, he probably may or may not have got a late stop in Brian Mendoza if he just kept at range and threw a lot of punches. But again, it was, you know, he, he let... He, like he gets hit a lot, he gets into wars, unnecessary wars, and, you know, Fight was able to make him pay for that, you know, so there you go, it's inevitable, you know, so, that's really all i got to say, <laughs> that's really all I have to say about this fight, but yeah, that's the end of this catch-up, um, thank you for watching, still have more videos in the way, so first, I'm out, peace. Thank <laughs> you.